I didn't really write a script or put a PowerPoint together because I'd like to leave plenty of room for questions so we can take this in whatever direction you'd like to uh, bring it to. It's, it was really interesting news here. Uh, uh, a year or two ago, we heard that uh, some researchers had decided that we started building cities as, uh, as a species, not to make bread, but to make beer. And I thought that was, <laughs> that was kind of enlightening. Uh, but people have grown grains about, started growing grains about when civilization started. And around the world, whatever uh, local grasses were there that had edible seeds, people started bringing them in, learning how to cultivate them, how to improve them, and how to uh, start making food from them. And I'm interested in every different kind of grain. You know, we started with soft white winter wheat. And I, I remember being told repeatedly by experts that you can't make bread out of our wheat. And you really can't eat our wheat. It's OK for maybe crackers. And I uh, thinking that doesn't make sense because people here ate their food for a long time. <laughs> you know, they weren't just eating crackers or making mush out of the wheat that grew here. And when we uh, started farming organically, I started reading a lot. Uh, William Albrecht got my attention. William Albrecht talked about the movement of the wheat belt across the United States and how the grain belt and the bread basket of the country used to be the Hudson Valley. And as the farmers farmed that land and to the point where the organic matter was depleted, the wheat wouldn't make the same quality bread anymore. And it moved to upstate, the Finger Lakes. And when that soil wore out, it moved to the Genesee country. And Genesee wheat was the standard bread wheat that fed New York City for a long time. And then as that soil was depleted, the wheat moved into Ohio and finally into the High Plains. Now that got me thinking that if this land grew bread wheat once, it can grow it again. And taking Albrecht's work, it would be logical to think that organic farms, where we're building organic matter and building soil life, should be able to grow a different quality of wheat. Another early observation I made, we started testing protein, especially on some of our old soft white wheats, and noticing that they were testing a lot higher in protein than they were supposed to when they were grown in organic soils. And just uh, fast forward a little bit, last summer we had a group of Hasidic rabbis come out. We do this every year to produce the grain for the uh, Passover matzah. And they wanted to see all the grains we had. And they took, I took them to a field of Frederick soft white wheat, and they started chewing on it. And it's supposed to not be suitable. And they said, I want to make matzah out of this because it's very high in protein. They would make them a nice big gluten ball. And this was a year when proteins were very low. And then we took them to our hard red that he was supposed to be using, and the hard wheat tested, it tested too low. So that, that kind of tells me there's some interactions going on here. But uh, that's kind of the mundane stuff. The interesting stuff is when we start growing the ancient grains. From uh, Elliot's here, I've learned a lot from the work you've done in the Middle East. Einkorn is probably the oldest of all the grains. And einkorn is a really interesting grain to look at. It doesn't remind us of our modern wheat because it's so small. You know, it's a very tiny plant. And my first impression was these, these are wimpy little weak things. And Ali explained that uh, maybe, they're, maybe they look wimpy, but these things can grow with almost no rainfall. Uh, these things can grow where nothing else can grow. And we had a small handful that we planted on our farm this was two years ago, immediately had a four inch rain on it. I thought we'd lost them. The field was bare going into winter. We also planted some black Hungarian hammer, which was another ancient grain. And actually, hammer is the ancient grain of Israel. I think there's still wild hammer growing around Jerusalem that uh, can be spotted. And I, I was really kind of uh, crushed by having all these you know, having this really bad weather and taking this precious seed and thinking I'd lost it. And towards spring, I noticed that there was a little green out there. This stuff's good, the four inch rain and the drowning and everything else that happened to it, the hard winter. And the next spring, the field was green. And look at it real close and it 
really grew differently from our other, from our modern wheats. Modern wheat might make two or three tillers. You know, an average of two was pretty good in the field. Some of these einkorn plants had 25 heads coming out of one root. And where it looked like we had bare soil, all of a sudden there was a crop of grain there. And the emmer was even more impressive. The emmer plants got as tall as my shoulder. And each one became a large cluster of plants. When we read about uh, the challenges to modern wheat, you know, the diseases, uh, Uganda 99 is attacking wheat, and some experts are saying it could that the entire world's wheat crop would be susceptible again, and that the genes we need to survive may be in these ancient grains. Well, why not grow them anyway? And I've got to say that Emmer, I, and this is where I should have a picture for you, is probably one of the most beautiful crops I've ever seen. It's got yellow straw, blue awns on the kernels, and brown beards, or blue hulls on the kernels, and brown beards. And it, it not only looks beautiful, but it has tremendous flavor. And when you try, when you eat some of these ancient grains, you taste things that we don't normally associate with wheat. There's there's nuttiness. Uh, there's there's complexity. Some of them have flowery flavors. And we have to. And you, you really ought to be doing this talk, Ali, because you've <laughs> you've been there and collected this stuff. And we came very, very close as a society to wiping out all this genetic diversity. We've transferred so many of our acres to some very narrow groups of genes, very narrow groups of crops, and wiped out so much of this diversity. And we're really fortunate that there were people in the Middle East, all around the world, and especially indigenous cultures, who continued growing these old grains and kept that alive for us. So on our farm now, we grow mainly uh, modern grains, including some spelt, which is, is more like the ancient ones. But we're bringing back emmer and einkorn. And another, another example of an ancient grain is not that the grain is so different, but the processing. And that's uh, something in the Middle East, it's called frika. And what the frika process is, and they tell me all around the world there are other similar grains. They're harvested when they're in milk, and they're still immature. And the green grain is then smoked or set on fire and roasted. And initially that was a harvest aid. Uh, in Germany there's a very similar grain that's being produced now, and has been since the Middle Ages, called green can. And that was invented when people were starving to death and their grain was green, and it wasn't ready to eat yet. And they did out of desperation. They went up and pulled the heads and roasted it over a beech wood fire and got it dry. And the next year when they had a good crop, they said, wow, that tasted pretty good. Let's try that again. And it became a local specialty. And I understand in some of the rice growing cultures, they have green roasted rice that's used. Are you familiar with any of them? That's, that's something I've read. and in, I think in the Middle East, the Frika is generally made out of durum. So we did something crazy. We took our spelt, and it was uh, just about in milk. And I did a little bit of homework on how you have to uh, process it. We went out in the field of the combine. I think the neighbors were ready to call the men with the white suits and the butter and white nets <laughs> because we went into the green field and actually harvested about five acres. And I uh, poured it into my soybean roaster and set the temperature as hot as possible, almost set it on fire, and held it in a tank to steep, just like you put a lid on a pot. And I noticed after a couple hours I had to do something different because there's a food safety issue when you've got that kind of humidity and that kind of temperature in the middle of the summer. So we put it into the dryer and dried it very quickly, uh, ran it through the dehuller, and we got a green grain that you can cook like rice that was really delicious. And uh, we, I think it was about a day later, Dan Barber happened to visit uh, from Stone Barns. And it's an interesting story about this particular batch of grain. The, Dan took a bag home with him. 
And he said that night, Al Gore ate at his restaurant, and Al Gore ate the first, <laughs> was the first person to eat this grain. Which made me feel pretty good that somebody, <laughs> somebody thought enough of it, but they're now using that as a specialty. And where I'm going with all these uh, different experiences is, as farmers, we can try to continue, we can try to do what is normal, and that's to produce higher and higher yields for less and less, because we're always going to compete for the lowest price. Or we can go out and do something that nobody else is doing, and bring a product to people who don't know they want it yet. Uh, to me, it's a lot more fun to do something that not everybody else is doing and have, have somebody come back and say, wow, I tried that, I never had anything like it, and it's really good, I want to eat more. And I think this type of, these ancient grains have a real, would fit, at least conceptually, into CSAs, into the market garden type farms. I think they fit in another way, and that's biologically, when we grow too many vegetables on land, we create an imbalance in the soil. And you know, we have too many of the same types of plants. Grains have a balancing effect biologically. They put mature carbon back into the system. And I, I remember being told that in Europe, in one of the biodynamic universities, they were studying soils and they were saying that uh, there were a lot less agronomic problems, a lot less weeds, and a lot less other issues on vegetable farms who also had a balance of grain in their system. So I think we're looking at an opportunity here, and this we're only scratching the surface. Ellie tells me you've got how many species of ancient grains that nobody has seen in years? Oh, there's probably about 10 very threatened species that I'm trying now. I work with the Republic of Georgia. The Transcaucus region has a lot of eight species. Okay, so this is eight different species yet that are not being used, and who knows what kind of foods we could make out of them that taste different from what we're used to. And I often, uh, especially in the Midwest, uh, when we're doing talks, people say, well, could organic farming actually feed the world? This might be okay for something that a few people support, but really couldn't feed the world. And I say, there's absolutely no question that organic farming could feed the world, with one major caveat, that it would not be a diet of high fructose corn sweetener in hydrogenated soy. It would have to be a much more diverse diet. We can maintain high yields and we can farm continually on this land if we give the land the biodiversity that it needs. And then if we give people the biodiversity in terms of the food that they need to be healthy. In doing that, we can take different groups of plants and follow them after each other in a way that creates soil health. And I feel on the other side, it, where we're creating human health. For example, we found when we were growing beans, you now this is supposed to be about ancient grains, but everything is connected. After about the second or third cycle, our beans were getting root rot and our yields had dropped in half. Georgia Bowie at Cornell explained that we were getting buildups of pathogens in the soil, and that the group of plants that we were growing wasn't doing anything to suppress it. He also explained that there's some groups of plants that suppress these diseases very effectively. One of those groups is the grains. We were negating that because we were underseeding the grains of the legume because the legumes make it worse. But he said there's also plants that suppress the, very severely depress these diseases, and those are the brassicas. So on our farm, we had too many grains but not enough of the broadleafs, the brassicas, the forbs. And we were able to bring them together. And by doing so, the yields of the beans doubled. So every one of these plants has some benefit to the soil and fits into a mosaic of other plants. And all farming is local, too. We have different conditions, so if not, the system that works on our farm well, may not transplant to Vermont exactly, but the same principle works. You know, what works in the North Country of New York is not going to look exactly like what works in the Hudson Valley. But this principle of having finding different plants that change, each plant changes the soil a little bit, each plant has some positives and some negatives, and each one creates an environment that will make a different species or a different group of species be the best adapted. 
And to my uh, understanding, organic farming is all about trying to create an environment where the plant we're trying to grow is the best adapted species for that environment. When we do that, that plant has a biological advantage over all the weeds, and it makes the farmer's job a lot easier. But we can't do that unless we bring much more diversity onto our farms, because it's, it's sort of like throwing half the tools out of your toolbox and then trying to fix something. And that's sort of what agriculture has done. Now, I think we've hardly scratched the surface with what the ancient grains can do for us, both economically and culturally and biologically in our land. And that's uh, another piece of this, bringing grains. And if you look at the doomsday ball, and I've got some thoughts on that this is a really good idea to try to save all this germplasm, but we're only saving half of the picture. We've split agriculture. we split the agri from the culture. We can put the seeds there, but we're not putting the knowledge of the farmers in that ball. You know, that's that part is lost. When we move a seed, and I, I can give you two examples of where seeds were moved with terrible consequences because the culture wasn't moved with with the plant. One is when corn went to Mexico or went to from Mexico to Italy when people ate polenta. And they started having a terrible scourge of pellagra because they were fixing the corn by grinding it, doing the way, doing it the way you would with European grains, they didn't know that you have to make the, go through the hominy process in order to get all the nutrition you need. And I understand there was a Mexican, a Native American, visiting once in Italy and said, "I could fix this problem." And the doctors poo pooed him, "Say you idiot, you don't know what you're talking about." They could have saved people years of suffering if they had listened. So that, that's a case of moving a plant without moving the culture. Another one, and I'm stretching a little here, but I think, I think I'm pretty close to the truth. <coughs> In Northern Europe, the people ate rye because that's what grew there. But if you look at Northern European cuisine, people don't grind rye flour and pour it into bread and bake it like wheat. There's a reason for that. Rye is very hard to digest. And if you look at the way the Northern Europeans eat it, they malt it or sourdough it, and they let some biology digest it, pre-digest it, and then the people eat it. And there's some really de delicious types of bread that I've had in Northern Germany that are basically, you can see the whole kernels of black rye. They're very sweet. Uh, they're very satisfying to eat, but they're also very good for the digestive system. You know, if we contrast that to, to a hard, heavy rye flour baked into a bread, there's a big difference in flavor, but there's also a difference in health. And some people are going to have trouble from eating that. Now, I understand when Dr. Borlaug started the Green Revolution, he took a chromosome from rye and put it into wheat. And I'm going to stick my neck out here. I could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Uh, and we're also noticing that people have trouble eating modern wheat. There's a lot of allergies. It really doesn't make sense to me biologically that we should have so much gluten intolerance and so much wheat allergy and so much trouble eating a food that our, uh, that our culture co-evolved with. Something, to me, something is wrong. Could it be that the genes that came on that rye chromosome have changed our wheat? and that we've taken some traits and put something in our diet that wasn't originally there. And I know there are people in Germany that believe there are uh, lectins, other compounds in the rye that some people are sensitive to that we're getting in our modern wheats. Now the ancient grains are, you know, have not been messed with, so to speak. And I understand, for instance, red fife. Some people who say they can't tolerate wheat can eat red fife. Well, red fife is wheat. But it was the wheat in the form before the Green Revolution changes came into the wheat. And our Hasidic friends, and I mentioned that's what got us started, they have a lot of members of their, that community 
who cannot tolerate eating modern wheat. They, you know, to, to meet the requirement of the, the Passover, they have to eat the matzah, but then they become very ill because they can't tolerate it. But they can eat spelt matzah. Now, spelt matzah has gluten in it. But for some reason, these people who can't stand gluten can eat gluten that's in spelt. And they found that they can eat the gluten that's in emmer, which is very high in gluten. And there's, there's a whole other market you know, that, that would help people. But to me, this is uh, the fun of all this, is discovering what all these different cultures did with their food and rediscovering what we could be doing here and how much we could enjoy all these different things. Why don't we create a local Northeastern culture of food, a real agriculture where there's a feedback loop where people say, I really like this or I didn't like that. And we work with them to develop this local group of plants. And I think the ancient grains are offering us a really good opportunity. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I should open this up for questions. Sorry. 